Uh, good morning. It's my pleasure to be with you. We're talking today about adjudicating corporation cases, and I thought I'd start by giving a little background on the Delaware system in our courts, and then give us case study, uh, an evolution, a chronology, if you will, of some issues involving controlling shareholders. Uh, in Delaware, at the trial level, corporate cases are decided by the Court of Chancery, and there are five judges on the Court of Chancery. It, it's like your um, economic court. Appeals go directly to the Delaware Supreme Court, where we also have five justices. So all the corporation law in Delaware is made by 12 indivi uh, 10 individuals, 10 at the trial level, excuse me, five at the trial level, five at the Supreme Court level. And just by way of um, example, in the United States, there are 1,000 federal judges. As you know, Delaware law dominates corporate law because state law under our Constitution controls. So you can see if you have 10 people deciding corporate cases, you get more predictability and stability than if we had a national corporate law with 1,000 judges. Now, the appeals to the Delaware Supreme Court um, are decided unanimously 99% of the time. We were hearing about your divided decision, and the reason we come out unanimously 99% of the time is because we must decide the case. We don't get to pick and choose. And in deciding the case, we narrow the holding. So many times the Delaware Supreme Court is criticized for not deciding some issue on the horizon, but we've said many times in Paramount, for example, we only decide the case before us. This is known as the Delaware unanimity norm. And it's not just corporate cases, but other cases we decide unanimously 99% of the time. But that's particularly important in corporate cases because businesses would like to know what the law is going to be. And by having unanimous decisions, it promotes stability and predictability. Uh, I'm sure you're still waiting for the final answer on how to value corporations, although you currently have the majority positions, but obviously the minority view uh, is also strong. The other aspect of deciding cases that's unique to Delaware is that we decide cases promptly. Uh, we have a rule that all courts must decide cases 90 days after they're ready to be decided. So that means the briefing is done, the argument takes place, and we have to decide the case within 90 days. In Delaware, the Supreme Court, on the average, issues an opinion every 40 days. So you can tell your clients, we're going to get a decision in 90 days, but probably closer to 40 days. And in corporate matters, cases can be expedited if the parties want them expedited. So we heard reference to former Chancellor Allen. In 1989, he decided the Time Warner case. Uh, I was on the appeal in that case. And there were six weeks of discovery. He issued a very long opinion. And three weeks later, it was decided by the Delaware Supreme Court unanimously. A couple of years ago, um, we had a case involving Liberty Media. It was a $9 billion issue, and the Delaware Supreme Court issued a unanimous 50-page opinion in seven days. Now, the reason we can do this um, is because of what I would call experience and expertise. And you develop the expertise through experience. We have 100 years of precedent. So when the judges on the Court of Chancery and the Delaware Supreme Court are deciding a case, they can look at what's been going on for 100 years and then advance the law incrementally or marginally. Because almost all of the publicly traded companies and all of the Fortune 500 companies are incorporated in Delaware, we have a lot of corporate litigation. And you also develop expertise through repetition. Uh, in addition to that, 
um, in the United States, states can pick judges any way they want. Some states elect judges. In Delaware, we appoint judges uh, based on merit selection, and we know when someone's going to the family court or the court of chancery or the Supreme Court what their background is, so we try to pick people who already have the expertise, and then they can continue to develop the expertise once they're on the court. Now, one of the things that's developed over time uh, in this 100 years is familiar to all of you, and that's the business judgment rule. And the business judgment rule is a presumption that the board of directors were informed, meaning care, acted with loyalty and in the best interest of the corporation. So when you come into a Delaware court, it's presumed that you did it right. And that presumption is very powerful and it's very important because the Delaware courts recognize that if someone is going to take a risk, they have to have latitude when the decision doesn't succeed. So if you decide you're gonna invent the best car in the world and you act with care, loyalty, and good faith, and your car is a failure, nobody buys it, you lose money, the Delaware Supreme Court would respect that decision because we want to encourage risk taking because that's the way a market economy works. But in a case called Aronson, the Delaware Supreme Court said, you don't get the protection of the business judgment rule if it's an interested transaction. So if you're on both sides of the transaction, the business judgment rule presumption doesn't apply at all. And what you have to do is demonstrate to the court that the transaction was entirely fair. So what you can see is that under the business judgment rule, the burdens on the shareholder to show there was a problem under the entire fairness standard, the burdens on the directors to show that everything was fine. And obviously directors and shareholders like different standards. Now, under the entire fairness standard, which is developed in a case called Weinberger, we said that you have to show fair dealing, meaning the process worked well, and then you have to show that you arrived at a fair price. Over time, the Delaware Supreme Court said these concepts apply to controlling shareholders. So if you're a controlling shareholder and you're involved with buying out the minority, it's an interested transaction. So the business judgment rule is not going to apply. And what I'm gonna tell you about are the cases over time where there was the debate between the Court of Chancery and the Delaware Supreme Court on how a controlling shareholder could ever get business judgment rule review rather than entire fairness review. Um, and, and it starts with a case called a Rosenblatt. And you remember I said, if you're on both sides of the transaction, it's your burden to show that it was entirely fair. And in the Rosenblatt case, the question was, well, how about if we get a majority of the minority shareholders to approve what we wanna do? Can we get business judgment? And the Delaware Supreme Court said no. You can shift the burden to the plaintiff, but you can't get business judgment. So at that point in time, what you see is the controlling shareholder is trying to buy out the minority, the standards entire fairness, but if they show that a majority of the minority approved it, they can shift the burden. And then instead of the directors going first, the shareholders have to go first. So time went on. And the Court of Chancery um, is a very important court for many reasons that you know about. But one thing is that many of the Court of Chancery decisions are never appealed. And that means that they are the Delaware law until it comes to the Delaware Supreme Court. So years ago, one of the other issues that was percolating in the Court of Chancery was, what happens if you have an independent committee they're separate from the controlling shareholder. 
How about if the independent committee approves the interested transaction? Can we get business judgment or do we still have entire fairness? And the five judges on the Court of Chancery were divided. So that issue came to the Delaware Supreme Court in a case called Kahn versus Lynch. And in Kahn versus Lynch, the Delaware Supreme Court said no, once again, if you have an independent committee that's fully functioning, you can shift the burden, but you still don't get entire fairness. So after Kahn versus Lynch, the law in Delaware was the controlling shareholder has to show entire fairness. But if they have a majority of the minority approving it, or, and or is the key word, an independent functioning committee approve it, they can shift the burden and they'll get, um, the other side will have to go first. Now, that turned out to be a problem as the years went by, because many times when you were looking at the independent committee, the function of the committee really related to the merits of the transaction. And the Court of Chancery decided, we really can't decide whether the burden should shift until we have a trial. So the state of the law then was, before the trial, you can make a motion for summary judgment and say we have a fully functioning independent committee, please shift the burden, let's start the trial. Or you can say we have a majority of the minority that's voted, please shift the burden, let's start the trial. And the Court of Chancery just couldn't do that very often with independent committees. So the result was you started the trial, but you didn't really know who was going to have the burden. In a case called America's Mining, which is significant for other reasons, the Delaware Supreme Court said, let's provide clarity. And we said the rule is going to be, if you can't shift the burden before the trial by establishing the independence and the process of the committee, or by establishing a fully disclosed minority, majority of the minority vote, then the burden's just not going to shift. So that's the law now. You have to establish one or the other before the trial, or the burden remains with the controlling shareholder. Now, <laughs> America's Mining is a case that was decided um, two years ago, and it was significant for a couple of reasons. First, it developed the law that I just told you about. But second, it was a controlling shareholder uh, interested transaction where the controlling shareholder lost the case. And the judgment against the controlling shareholder was over $2 billion. And the attorney's fees that were awarded were $300 million. And what happened in that case was the committee was independent, but uh, according to the chancellor, they exercised or demonstrated what was called a controller mindset. So as a result of that, um, they didn't come up with a fair price and that's why the judgment was so high. So then we come forward uh, to this year and the Delaware Supreme Court decided a case called MFW. And after many years of debate about burden shifting, if you have a majority of the minority or an independent committee that functions, the Court of Chancery had kept saying over and over, how about if you have both? If you have an independent committee fully functioning and an informed vote of the majority of the minority, can we get business judgment? And the Court of Chancery said, yes. And that was appealed to the Delaware Supreme Court. And the issue was uh, the Delaware Supreme Court Agreed, we affirmed. So the law in Delaware now is that if you're a controlling shareholder and at the very beginning of the transaction with the minority, you declare, we're not going to go forward with this transaction unless you have both a majority of the minority vote and the recommendation of a fully functioning independent committee. Uh, then if you do that, and you prove both of those things, or then you're going to be able to get business judgment. 
Now, what's significant about that is that because this was being decided for the first time in the Court of Chancery, it was a summary judgment case. And there had been a lot of discovery, and there was a full record, and the Court of Chancery said the controlling shareholder had established those things, granted summary judgment, applied the business judgment rule, and the case was dismissed on summary judgment. But the real issue in the case was can you ever get the complaint dismissed? And what the Court of Chancery said is, yes, you can get the complaint dismissed, and you don't have to go through the expense of discovery, and the Delaware Supreme Court agreed. Now, whenever we write our decisions, we think we're writing with clarity, and as I said, they're unanimous, but inevitably, uh, professors and lawyers look at our opinion and wonder what we really meant. And this isn't new. When we decided the Time Warner case in 1989, we thought we were pretty clear. But then four years later, in 1993, in Paramount versus QVC, we had to make it even clearer. So I'm going to tell you as clearly as I can what we intended in MFW, even though people are reading it different ways. And what we intended in MFW is to say there are cases where the majority shareholder puts these two, two protections in place and they will get dismissed. The complaint will get dismissed. Now, in the chancellor's decision, he said, if you can show the committee wasn't independent or you can show that there wasn't full disclosure, raise a question about that, then the complaint would not get dismissed. But the Delaware Supreme Court was thinking, lawyers will learn from our opinion, and they'll advise their controlling shareholder accordingly, and a lot of complaints will be dismissed because you can't raise a question. So let me give you an example of how I think that will work. We don't want protracted discovery if you're gonna dismiss a complaint, but before you bring the lawsuit, you can get the SEC filings about the independence of the committee, and you can ask for the books and records of the company about the independence of the committee. If those filings show that your independent committee were your three cousins, no one else? No one would think that's an independent committee. So the complaint wouldn't get dismissed because while you said you put an independent committee in place, you really didn't. On the other hand, people know that the three cousins aren't gonna withstand judicial scrutiny so you never have an independent committee composed of three cousins. You have an independent committee composed of really independent people. You can find those facts and the complaint will be dismissed. So we'll see how that plays out, but I thought it was important for me to clarify for you that the majority unanimous opinion in MFW thought that controlling shareholders would learn from our opinion and complaints would get dismissed without discovery. Now the last point I wanna make uh, before I conclude is that there are other situations where the controlling shareholder isn't dealing with the minority, but third parties are involved. So the first principle of Delaware law would be that if you just wanna sell your stock, your majority stock to a third party, you can do that. There are no fiduciary duties, no concerns, uh, you can just sell your stock. But once the whole company is going to be sold and there's going to be consideration for you that's maybe different than the minority or the whole company is going to be sold and you have a, a right to veto the sale of the whole company, there are other considerations that come into place. And the Court of Chancery has decided a case called Hammonds. And what the Court of Chancery said in Hammonds is that in those situations, maybe you should put the two procedural protections in place that we see in MFW. Now that case hasn't come to the Delaware Supreme Court yet, and the Court of Chancery isn't completely unanimous in its view, so that's an area of the law that will develop. So and, um, in conclusion, what you can see is that the law develops over a period of time marginally, but as it develops marginally, it does promote stability and predictability. And while it's taken a long time for the Delaware Supreme Court to say, 
if you have the dual protections of a minority vote and the business judgment rule uh, and the um, independent committee, you can get the business judgment rule. The question is how many people are gonna try to put in dual protections? And if you don't put in the dual protections, we're gonna be back to the entire fairness standard and the question will be, does the burden shift or doesn't it shift? So I want to um, conclude now because I've used my time, but I am happy to answer any questions. Um, Zohar said I could answer questions for five minutes. Yes? Um, when you get the fair price under the fair, uh, under the entire fairness, what does it mean? Is it the highest price or is it just the best price under the circumstances which you do a DCF on? Yeah, what the Delaware Supreme Court has said is that there's no one model. So most of the time people are using the um, discounted cash flow, but not always. They're doing market comparisons and they're doing other things. And what we see most frequently in those cases is they try to take a triangulated approach and they come up with three valuations. DCF is only one of them. And they try to say they all basically come out the same way. Yes. I'd like to understand uh, under a uh, MFW method or principle, how you can know without discovery uh, that the independent committee did the job well. Well, that's what I was saying, that um, the only source of information would be SEC filings, which are pretty complete. And under Section 220 of the Delaware Corporate Code, if you're a shareholder, you can ask for books and records. So one of the things you would ask for is the committee's report, the committee valuation. But in Delaware, you don't get any pre-complaint discovery. But in MFW, we said your remedy under Section 220 combined with SEC filings should give you enough information if there is a problem to identify the problem. Well, thank you very much.